It's been 40 years, hard to believe, 40 years ago that I was in my last semester in seminary preparing to graduate and uh, begin the journey of ministering a local church, but a few months prior to that, I'd already entered the, the job search and uh, trying to see where Gene and I would settle and start our family. Of course, I was at school in Boston, and uh, that would be the most likely place to stay in our denomination because uh, uh, it's the only place in the country we outnumber Methodists and Baptists, I believe. So job opportunities were abundant there, but our family, our grandparents and so forth were out west, so we looked at uh, Colorado. And in the January of 1982, I flew out there to interview. And if some of you are not familiar with our process, you know, uh, they can choose to enter. It's, it's like a normal. Nobody makes us go anywhere, interview anywhere, or shifts us around. Uh, we interview, we choose to interview, they choose to interview us, and if it works out, why we uh, start our ministry together. So I flew out there and I went through the process. I met with the committee. They asked all their questions. They showed me the facility and so forth, uh, and the town. Uh, and of course, there wasn't a lot to see in Wiggins, Colorado. Uh, if you're a country western fan, you may have heard of it because uh, there was a song called uh, a flatbed of, chicken, uh, flatbed of chickens riding out of Wiggins. But other than that, I'm, I'm sure you haven't. Uh, town population was 500, membership of my church was 401. <laughs> so, you know, you get the picture. It's, 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 it's a good country setting. Well, anyway, <clears throat> after the inter -proce interview process was all done and the uh, familiarity kinds of items, I was invited over to uh, the house for dessert that evening, night before I would leave, with the rest of the committee and their spouses and uh, the woman hosting it, her home, she was the secretary of the church and I would eventually work with her for a number of years. Anyway, she was serving three kinds of pie, apple pie, cherry pie, and pumpkin pie. Now, I don't know what you would choose, but I am a big fan of pumpkin pie and so I chose that. Now, nobody else in that whole room chose pumpkin pie, just me. And as we all started to eat away, and you know, you're kind of talking and conversing and trying to eat at the same time, I took my fork and I took a piece of that pie and I put it in my mouth and I thought I was going to throw up. It was absolutely putrid, I mean, it was awful. And of course you're thinking, well, I kind of like the job. Um, it would be quite a breach of protocol if I spit that out on the table, even though, <laughs> even though that was what it felt like I should do. But we went through the whole evening and I ate the entire piece of pie. Ugh. <laughs> I ate the entire piece of pie um, and eventually was, was hired there. And after about three years, Florence, the woman who had, had hosted the event and made the pie, and she was my office secretary, after about three years, she came to me and she said, I've been waiting three years to ask you, how in the world did you manage to eat that pie? She said, that evening after you left, my husband said, I want a piece of that pumpkin pie, and he's sitting there watching the TV, and he takes a bite, and one bite, and he spits it out all over and says, this is absolutely the worst pie I have ever had. And she said, that's when I remembered I put, I forgot to put in sugar. <laughs> well, this leads me to the question. Tell me, was that pie good or was that pie bad? What do you think? It was different, it was different that's for sure. <laughs> but that's not a choice. Was it good or was it bad? It was good, you think so? It was awful. It didn't meet my expectations. I don't think it met God's expectations. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, was it good or bad? What do you think? Hmm? Yeah, the pie was bad. 
I'm going to stick with that. But it was good because it helped me get the job. <laughs> so the pie was bad, but it was also good. From a job perspective, it was good. It wasn't a bad thing. Which brings me to kind of my thought process here, because there is no one way to define or to limit our understanding or definition of good and bad. You ever think about that? There really isn't a way to say, well, this is what it means to be good. It depends upon the situation. It depends upon the people that are involved and a host of other variants in every other aspect that we have no control over. I thought of that when I read this parable of Jesus about the Good Samaritan and thought to myself, well, we always call him good. I wonder what that really means, good. And of course, <clears throat> when we listen to Jesus' stories or uh, reflect on his parables or his message, <clears throat> we hear them all, but I think most of us, when we, when we hear these stories, and we think about the characters in them, we always think of them from the perspective of the good person. We read ourselves into the story as the hero, the one who did right, the one who acted smart, the one who was the definition of good. Do you remember uh, Jesus said, uh, he talked about uh, the religious figure who's standing at the altar and he's praying next to a, a tax collector and his prayer is, thank God I'm not like this man. <clears throat> Which is, e immediately, who are we in that story? Well, I'm the good person. I'm not that guy. Maybe I wouldn't say it that way, but I'm not that person, thank goodness. And yet, Scripture does not come alive unless you're willing to take the risk of reading yourself into all the characters, to see the story from 360 degrees, not just a narrow vision, to understand why is each of those characters there? What's their role? How important are they? And what do they have to say that's deeper and farther and richer than face value? That's how scripture stays alive. You know, if you read it just one way, all you see is this good Samaritan and the villains in the background and whatever else, because that's the way it's been preached or taught or whatever, but it comes alive and it makes us think when we say, well, what if I were this other person? What if I were this other person? And this story of the good Samaritan is a prime example and invitation to do this because we have three main characters, three main perspectives on the same event. To begin with, we have the man who's beaten and robbed. Now, I don't know if anybody here has ever experienced that, been robbed or had something stolen or uh, mugged or whatever. It's not a good feeling. It's, it is a violation. And, Beyond that, you know, you're, you're at your worst. You get beat up and you're laying there. Who's going to help you? You know, you're thinking, is anybody going to come along? Am I going to live? Am I going to die? I wonder how bad my wounds are. And you really don't care who helps you, do you? You just want somebody to come along and help. So you toss out any other kinds of, well, I don't want that kind of person, or I don't like that kind of person, or I hope that kind of person doesn't. You don't care. You just want somebody to help you. Believe me, I grew up in western Nebraska, and your car breaks down. You're going to take a lift from anybody who comes along. You know, it's like the guy driving out in, in the middle of nowhere out there, and he stops to pick up a hitchhiker, and the hitchhiker says to him, you know, uh, I'm kind of surprised you pit, picked up a hitchhiker. What if I was a serial killer? And the driver said to him, well, I thought about that, but, you know, the odds of two serial killers being in the same car is <laughs> So you take whatever help comes along, don't you? 
But in addition to that, I wonder what he's doing there in the first place. I wonder how smart this guy is or, or what he thinks. He's traveling alone on one of the most dangerous stretches of road you can imagine. Jerusalem is 330 feet elevation above Jericho. Jericho is 700 feet below sea level. This is a strenuous climb and walk down into the depths of the desert. Uh, nobody is there except Bedouins to this day with their, their sheep and their wandering. It's a great place to hide out. And if you're gonna mug somebody, <clears throat> this is the place to do it. So why is, why is he there? Why is he walking alone? Was he visiting family? Was he on business? Um, we don't know. <clears throat> the story doesn't want us to get into any of that. None of that matters. He must have been wor worth robbing, we know that, but even that's relative. I mean, you know, you don't have to have a lot for somebody else to want what you do have. And so the man who's beaten, that's not, there's nothing there to look for. His name is not given and his face is blurred. He's just a per person in desperate need of help. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been, felt that way? I mean, not maybe literally beaten up, but have you ever felt beat up by life? Down at the bottom, robbed of this, robbed of that, robbed of health, robbed of sight, robbed of, you know, whatever. Have you ever been there? How you got there, what the path you chose, none of that really matters at the time. All you want is someone to care someone to provide assistance and help. <clears throat> so there's one perspective in this story. We've all been in the place of the man beaten and robbed. Then also we have the priest and the scribe. Now, most often these people, these characters you know, they're portrayed almost as heartless and villains, but let's give them a break. Let's cut them some slack. <clears throat> These were the keepers of the law. These were the Supreme Court of the Jesus era. I mean, they interpreted the laws and whether people were getting, upholding them. And you know, 630 laws, don't eat this, don't eat that. Uh, don't work on the Sabbath. Well, what is work? Is, is carrying keys in your pocket work or is it not? You know, all these kinds of things. And one of the laws is you don't touch someone who's bleeding. The purity laws, you know, for whatever reason, blood was a, a big red flag, no pun intended, uh, a big red flag, a no-no. And so here's the irony. They're keeping the law they're not doing anything wrong. In fact, they're doing what everybody would expect them to do. They are doing the righteous thing. Think about that for a while. We always jump on them, but by the law of the day, they were doing precisely what everybody would expect them to do. You know, it, let's just say they had some religious responsibilities. They were coming from Jerusalem, but maybe they had some others. If they did and they touched this man in any way, they would not be able to do them, perform them. They would be unclean. So they would have to abstain, step back, be separated for a period of time, then go through the ritual and be declared clean again by another priest. So they would be out of action for some time. So they were not only keeping the law, they were keeping their appointment schedule. They were keeping on track with what, with what they're supposed to do, what they're paid to do, what their job description says they should do. And they know that guy needs help, but, but you know what? I have things I have to get on to. I have responsibilities, you know. I will call somebody else. The show must go on. Let me ask the same thing. Have you ever been caught in that kind of situation? Have you ever encountered something where, you know, I woulda, shoulda, coulda, but I, you know what? I had things I needed to do. I have, you know, my people are meeting with your people and my people are important and your people are important. We can't blow that off. We have to get on. 
with what we're supposed to do and not be distracted by this other stuff. You know, there is a challenge. This, this, this did happen to me. What do you do if you're in my position, my job, my responsibilities, and you're at the peak of church season, a lot of people coming, they're all expecting, uh, yeah, somebody can fill in, but to a degree they're expecting to see you, and right before the service starts, you get a call that someone from the congregation was in a severe car accident and is at the local hospital. What do you do? They may die. Do you say, well, they can wait an hour? I'll cut the sermon down to 45 minutes. That's a joke, friends. Huh? <laughs> Maybe I am preaching too long. I have to work on that. You know, what do you do? What's your true responsibility? Aside from your job description, aside from your calendar, what are you really about? What are you called to do? What resides at the core of your being, your calling, out of which you respond and live and act? You're only going to help one person, and it's only one person, and you got 500 waiting. What do you do? So we have the priest and the Levite. They were just doing their job, nothing wrong. Then we have the Samaritan. And the fact that his ethnicity is named in the story is important. This we're supposed to take into accountability. Historically, Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. There was no love lost between them. I explained all of them to you, and anyone touching them, you know, they can't be a very law-abiding Jew because they would become unclean, impure, they would take that person's mess upon themselves. But this Samaritan was willing to do all of that. I don't think the man beaten cared that he was a Samaritan, and the Samaritan didn't care anything about the man's whatever that was beaten. All the Samaritan saw was the need beyond his own needs, and he helped. And not only did he dive into the situation and get his hands dirty, you know, this is risky business. Wouldn't you be thinking, man, those guys mugged him. What if I stop? What if they're still looking around? They might get me. And where he goes the second mile is he does the triage he needs to to get this person up. And I don't know, maybe he put him on his donkey, I don't know, and took him to the nearest Palms Hospital. But he says to the administrator of the hospital, he says, you know, take care of this person and anything that Medicare doesn't cover, I'll cover. Now, once again, we might say, well, he obviously had the wealth to do that. You don't know that. All we know is he was willing to take on whatever needed, whatever was needed. He was willing to take it on and take this man's load as his own. So I tell you, this is what we know about these characters when you look at them from all these different perspectives. And I'm just scratching the surface. You could go much deeper. So my question is, is it fair to really label any of them good or bad? Really, is it fair to place on them a label of good or bad uh, solely upon the one story we know? I would submit that the priest and Levite probably in other situations were looked upon as very good and having done the right thing, you know? In this, particular, in this particular situation, the Samaritan just jumps in, and that jumps out at us, and so we remember him. Nothing stopped him, nothing got in his way from doing, and I think this is really at the core, not only of the parable of what I hope you will take home with you. Nothing stood in the way of the values and the priorities that lay at his core. The Samaritan is an illustration of a person who is really, really in touch with who they are and what they are really about. 
There were no excuses, I mean, no labeling, not, none of the other stuff going on that we get a, we ask for a pass. This guy knew who he was and at great risk and cost, he was willing to do what was necessary. We don't know, maybe the priest and the scribe came back later in the day when they found time. We don't know. And just because they didn't help in this situation, you know, maybe a week ago they did in some others. You know, the truth is, even the worst minister gets a good sermon now and then. <laughs> Father and the son are walking out of church. <laughs> Father and the son are walking out of church and the little boy gives his offering of a dollar to the minister and the minister says, so why are you giving that to me? Well, I thought it was the right thing to do because my dad says you're the poorest preacher he's ever heard. <laughs> even, even the worst preacher gets a good sermon now and then. So what's my point? Friends, my point is, to refrain from judging and labeling others. You know, when you're in a need, you don't care who they are. And if you're really a person who wants to help, you don't care who the person is that needs help. Because at your core is that priority and value that says, I just need to help, that's who I am. That's what I do. Now, I know that at times situations and skills don't match. You know. Uh, People stop and take pictures when there's a car accident when they should just get out of the way and let nurses or other healthcare people stop and do what they're trained to do. I understand that. But maybe there's something else they can do or help. Maybe it's just keeping people away from the other people. I don't know. You have to know what you're going to do. My family was on an airplane one time, and my daughter, the psychologist, and myself, and my father-in-law, the geologist, and they asked, is there a doctor on the plane who can help? Oh, we're all three doctors, but our skills don't match that need. You know, that doesn't make us bad people. It doesn't. It, it, there's, what else can we do? What else can we do? What's going on here? You see, what determines good or bad is always relative, except when we own it honestly measured against the core in our heart. You know, you can call me bad, but what's at my core that makes me act the way I do? You follow me? I can't measure that. You can't measure that. And when we look at each other, we only get glimpses of other people. You know, I'm not a nice person. You only see me here. Sometimes I'm not nice here. You see what I'm saying? You, you don't get that. And we do that too easily. What we can say is the actions of this person, this Samaritan, who is nameless, who doesn't have a plaque or anything in their honor, probably has their name plastered on more hospitals and care centers than any other in the country. Isn't that, oh, that's kind of amazing. You know, people give millions to get their name somewhere, and the Samaritan did it just because of what he did. He has inspired generations for centuries. You know, it's a tough title to seek, to live up to, the Good Samaritan. We have to own that. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, sometimes we could, and we don't, sometimes we can, and we do. What matters, friends, is do we try? Do we try to do what we can, as we can, when we can, as we should, if we could, based upon who we are in Christ. Rabbi, minister, priest, doctor, lawyer, American, Mexican, European, gay, straight, that doesn't matter. Those things are no consequence here. The question is, do we try? Thus defining goodness, not by what we don't do, which is the way we usually define it. You know, I don't steal, I don't kill, I don't lie. I got those. But taking the hard road and defining goodness by what we do 
I have to say this carefully, what we do do. Defining goodness by what we do do, when we can, as we can, when we should, and as we could. Take it home and think about it. Read the par parable from another angle. You may find more. There's a lot here. Was the good Samaritan really good? Yes. He was really, really good. That's who he was. <laughs>